Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, we're going to get started, and um, hopefully some more folks will join us. I'd like to thank you um, for coming to our session this morning. I know we are one of the first sessions, so it's great to see your faces today. My name is Jasmine Wilson, and I am the program administrator of Reveal Digital's Behind the Scenes of the Civil Rights Movement's collection. And I'd like to thank CNI for hosting us today and allowing us to present our presentation, Opening Collections of Marginalized Voices Through Crowdfunding and Crowdsourcing. Today, I am joined by Michael Levine Clark, who's the Dean of the University of Denver Libraries and also an executive committee member of Reveal Digital, as well as Rhonda Gonzalez Manzanares, Dean of Library Services at Colorado State University Pueblo. Our presentation today will cover an overview of Reveal Digital, um, specifically for me, I'll be sharing a little bit of background about who we are, what we do, the collections that we work to publish. Um, and I'm going to pass things over to Michael to highlight from his perspective as a dean that has assisted in funding some of our programs and also his perspective as an executive committee member working with Reveal Digital. And Rhonda will be um, speaking with you about her experience collaborating with us as a sourcing institution for our student activism and independent voices collections most recently. Reveal Digital started in 2012 as an independent nonprofit publishing project. And in 2019, we joined with Ithaca um, using the Ithaca JSTOR platform, as well as Portico, our preservation service, to make our collections readily available to the public open access. Ithaca is a nonprofit organization that seeks to improve access to knowledge and education for people around the world, and our collections are hosted on JSTOR, a core resource for students and faculty that allows us to put our content directly into the research flow with scholarly journals and monographs. Of the seven collections that we curate, um, I'm gonna highlight Independent Voices, which is Reveal Digital's first project that we did starting in 2013, um, predating our joining with Ithaca. And this collection is a digital collection that focuses on alternative press, newspapers, and journals spanning the 1960s and 1980s, one of which um, CSU Pueblo has graciously contributed their La Cucaracha newspapers to recently. Our second collection is entitled Student Activism, which captures the voices of students across a great range of protest, political actions, and equal rights advocacy from the 20th and early 21st century of the United States. Her third collection, American Prison Newspapers, focuses on bringing together hundreds of newspapers across the United States published within prisons by incarcerated persons over the past 200 years. And when this collection is complete, it will contain newspapers representing institutions of all kinds, highlighting, in addition, women's only institutions. Our fourth collection is HIV, AIDS, and the Arts. And this particular collection is scoped to be international, seeking out materials that highlight and document the artistic response to the HIV, AIDS epidemic. Our fifth collection, Black Periodicals, seeks to deepen the coverage of the black press and kind of expanding on the work that we've done with independent voices by highlighting black periodicals from the Great Migration era through the black power movement. Our Documenting White Supremacy and Its Opponents collection looks at KKK published newspapers and white supremacist led periodicals and placing them in conversation and in context with anti-Klan and anti-white supremacist voices from black-led press, Jewish-led press, among other groups um, that sought to um, 
disrupt some of those conversations that were pro-white supremacy. And the collection that I oversee is titled Behind the Scenes of the Civil Rights Movements. This is our, and will be, our largest collection to date with a goal to source up to one million pages of primary source material focused on highlighting the lesser known activists, organizations, groups, and persons from African American, Latin A, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and indigenous communities. And the one thing that I would say unifies each of these seven collections and um, upholds our mission is that they're focused on discovering and unearthing lesser known stories, lesser known histories, voices of dissent, marginalized groups, and social movements across the 20th and 21st centuries, which is the core of what we do for Reveal. Our approach includes working closely with libraries as funders to crowdfund our programs, um, and also to crowdsource material that we make publicly available on JSTOR. Reveal's collections are composed of archival material provided by libraries and archives of all sizes. And one example is my collection behind the scenes, which is one where we're actually working with churches, museums, public libraries, individual collectors, essentially any individual or organization that might have relevant material. Um, that will help expand the narrative of the civil rights movement era. We also allow content contributors to retain copyright ownership of any material that they source with us. And upon digitizing these items, we deliver those files back to contributors for them to be used at their own discretion. Through our crowdfunding approach, we're able to support the digitization, scanning, shipping, and preservation of all of the archival material that we display. And it's our hope that by doing this, we're helping to create broader access to material that might not otherwise be discovered. And we make this material available to everyone everywhere without a paywall. Our funding amounts are also transparent and significantly lower than the price paid by collections of a similar size and quality published under for-profit models. And I'll be sharing a bit more with you in the next slide, I believe, um, about how we do our funding and what that funding model can look like. And lastly, which I think is kind of the core theme of this presentation today, is our relationships with libraries. We view libraries as true partners that help in assisting us not only in contributing content and funding our programs, but also providing strategic and editorial guidance and giving us new ideas as we continue on in the future towards establishing new collections and identifying new opportunities to make material from lesser known groups and marginalized communities readily available. So to share a bit about our funding model, I have an example from our behind the scenes program where you'll see at the top um, of this slide that of our goal to reach $2.5 million and raise $2.5 million for this program, we've achieved about 62% of our funding progress. And our associate director, Peggy Glan, oversees all of our funding and is a critical person on our team who helps us raise all of the contributions, not only for behind the scenes, but all of our collections. And we make these um, progress goals readily transparent on our website. You'll also see on, for example, the behind the scenes collection page, a breakdown of our funding structure um, that includes how much money we've allocated for all of the costs to produce this program, um, costs for um, supporting our staff time and production team, um, among other different items that are critical to making this work possible. And through the support that Reveal Digital receives from all of the different libraries, as you'll see here, um, they're classified based on their status as between R1 and two-year colleges um, with a one-time contribution that you'll see listed before you. 
Um, and these contribution amounts are significantly lower than the price a library would be charged under for-profit models of similar size and quality. And it's our goal to continue nurturing those relationships um, as we grow our programs and seek to reach our goal for behind the scenes in our other collections. And at this point, I think it's time for me to hand it over to Michael, who will give you an even greater um, insight into his perspective as one of our funders and funding libraries for Reveal. Well, thanks, uh, Jasmine. Um, so I, I, uh, I have, I think, less to say um, overall than my two, my two co-presenters, but, but as, a, as a funding library, I, I want to convince everybody in the room that you should also be funding libraries if you're not already. So at, at the University of Denver, we've been sort of all in on, on digital primary source collections from the beginning, right? We, we, we acquired um, early English books online when that was the brand new thing, and we've kind of gone from there. And we have, we have I, I, I went into our database list to try to count how many collections we have from, from the various um, commercial publishers of primary source collections. And I gave up counting, so it's hundreds. Um, but I don't have an actual number. But we, we essentially buy, um, uh, or we license perpetual access rights to every collection Adam Matthew puts out, or AM, every collection Gale puts out, every collection ProQuest puts out, every collection Redex puts out, and so on, right? We, we, are, we are very much um, investors in digital primary source collections uh, to, the, to the tune of six figures annually, um, sometimes high six figures. Um, and this is all one-time money, but it's, it's a lot of money. It adds up. Um, this, this is important to us. It's, a, I think, a, a, an important educational experience for our students to, to be able to work really closely with um, the primary source content and history classes and so on. Um, but this benefits our students, it benefits our faculty, it doesn't really benefit anybody else that we license these collections. It benefits, and I, and I should say, it benefits our, our students and our faculty tremendously, but it, it's, a, it's a relatively small audience. I gave a presentation about um, the way we acquired and, and sort of the way we were using primary source collections at, at ERNL in probably 2016. And Peggy Glan was in the audience, Peggy from Reveal Digital, and she came up and talked to me afterwards about, about their model and what they were doing. And um, so I found myself um, joining their executive committee, and I found myself, um, uh, or I found my institution um, investing in, in building these collections. So there is an executive committee at Reveal Digital made up of libraries from across, across the US. Uh, this is an advisory committee, it helps sort of set set the goals and directions for what Reveal takes on as projects, um, how those are funded, um, what kinds of um, content is gonna be made available, uh, how to work with libraries, and so on. And in many ways, this presentation today comes out of conversations within that executive committee about the need to reach out a little bit more broadly to libraries and to, to make this model uh, more familiar to, to, to many of you. So I've already mentioned that right, we are a, a supporter of Reveal Digital at the University of Denver. Um, I think it fits well within our collections goals. It fits within our mission. It's something that we do because we, we should be doing it. And I would argue that most libraries that have a budget to cover um, primary source collections of any sort should also be doing this. So we, we do this because we value primary source content. We, we know that as we've built up these, these digital primary source collections, um, our, our history faculty especially, but faculty in the humanities more broadly, have started to change the way they construct courses. They have, they have assignments that are based on these primary source collections, and there, there are students that are getting a much more in-depth and meaningful um, relationship to, to the content that they're studying in history courses. Um, we also, at my university, and I, and I suspect at, at most of our universities, we are committed to investing in open content and open infrastructure. Right? We're committed to spending some of our budget, at least, on bettering um, access to material for libraries beyond our own library. Uh, 
when you start to look at the values for Reveal Digital, I think they align really well with ours, right? So this is this is a um, a set of projects that is about bringing um, underrepresented voices uh, to the fore, right? To making that material available to a much wider audience. Uh, there's a social justice commitment in terms of the the types of content and the types of themes that are that are um, digitized. Um, and it's really, um, importantly, culturally responsible practices, right? Where, where the, the material is digitized in ways that make sense for the producers and the um, owners of that content. And, and I think really importantly, our investment in the digitization process helps libraries like Ron does that um, have amazing material that maybe they couldn't digitize or, or could digitize but make, not make this widely available without this, this platform. So it feels like we're contributing to something that's really important as an institution. So it's a little bit frustrating to realize that, that many libraries don't actually participate. Um, so there are 69 R1 libraries, Research One libraries, that have um, uh, contributed 45% of all the funding so far to these, to these digitization projects. But there are far more than 69 um, R1 institutions, right? There are about 130 or so R1s. Um, only 152 institutions have contributed um, so far to all of the projects, uh, all of the seven um, collections uh, that Reveal has done. And most of them have not contributed more than once or more than twice. Right, so, so 152 institutions have contributed um, roughly, what is that, roughly 60 or so have contributed just to one, one year. Um, only a handful have contributed more than um, three or four times, right? It's, it's, it's not a huge contribution um, for the value of the content. And so part of why we wanted to get on the agenda here at CNI as the executive committee was to convince more people that they should contribute. Um, this is relevant-ish, um, right? This is not open access content in the way we tend to think of like scholarly communications, but institutions, um, this is an AR ARL snapshot, but institutions across the, across the US contribute um, more or less to open access and to open content. And, and we do so because we think that it is valuable to the larger ecosystem. And if you look at these numbers, the amounts that we could, we could all be contributing to something like Reveal Digital are relatively small in this greater context. So my, what I hope anybody who's, who's from a library in the room takes away from this is, it's not that hard to contribute um, to this important project, especially in the context of, of what you're contributing to larger open access um, funding. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to, to Rhonda uh, to talk about um, what her institution does to contribute content to, to these projects. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. So, um, uh, I want to just preface my remarks by saying that this will not be a technical presentation about how we scanned the collections. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we worked with Reveal Digital, but it's mostly a case study uh, about the interesting collection that we have. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me. I'm going to even delve a little bit into the history of the collection. <clears throat> I just want to, <clears throat> sorry, I want to kind of give you a little bit of, of heart for the work, um, why this is so critical to an institution like mine. So, um, once again, I'm Rhonda Gonzalez Manzanares. I'm at Colorado State University Pueblo, and um, we are a regional comprehensive university, Masters One. I'm struggling a little bit because I cannot see my bullet points. Okay, gotcha. Um, thank you. We are about 3,500 students. We are an HSI, and we have recently become an MSI. So we have about 50% of our students are from underrepresented groups. And um, we're located in Pueblo, Colorado, um, which is important because 
I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the importance of the place that we're located because it plays a role in the, why the collection is so important to us and, and to you. So Pueblo, Colorado is situated right along the Arkansas River in southern Colorado, and up until 1803, north of the river, the north part of our city was France, the southern part of our city was Spain. After uh, the Louisiana Purchase, it was United States and Spain, then Mexico, and eventually United States. So it's a very important border lands area. And the people that are living just south of the Arkansas River and in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico have mostly been there either forever because we're the um, ancestral home of the Ute, the Cheyenne, and the Hickory Apache peoples, or, or their families have been there for about 400 years. So um, they have a history that's rooted in the place where we are. And when that place, when that border crossed them and they became the United States and had their rights, their land, their language taken away from them, it was very disruptive. So um, that sort of sets the stage for why the Chicano movement was really important in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, my library is um, right in the heart of the campus. You're looking at a picture of our um, learning center on the second floor of the library. Um, it's pretty small. I have 12 full-time staff three part-time staff and about 40 student workers. They all report to me. Um, we're a small, mighty team. So um, that, again, just is why this is so important to a library like mine. We have collections, but we don't have the resources. Um, our whole collections budget is in the middle six figures. No, it's six, uh, around 645000 total for our collections budget. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense of what we have to work with. Um, one thing that is good for us, we're part of the CSU system, and um, that allows us to leverage some infrastructure that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. We um, share a digital repository as well as an Alma Primo ILS system with, with uh, CSU Fort Collins, and I see my, my counterpart Karen out there. Thank you for your support, Karen. Uh, but that does help. That helps a little bit. At least we're not, you know, just on our own trying to do everything. Um, so our archives uh, it has a lovely space. It's on the sixth floor of our building. This is our archivist you see there um, and one of our student workers. Um, they're very proud of the fact that they're not in the basement like most archives. They have the best view in the city of Pueblo. Um, so that's very nice for them. But... Um, Staffing-wise, we just have one FTE tenure-track faculty member and one 0.25 FTE project archivist specifically working on the Chicano Movement Archives Collection and about three students. So our usual workflow is you, we get a collection in, our archivist or our student workers process the collection. If we have the manpower at the moment, we digitize um, and then create metadata Etc. We try to leverage collaborative relationships and uh, grant funding whenever we can to expand our work, and we've been pretty successful with that. In 2016, we had a grant that allowed us to digitize part of this La Cucaracha collection that we're talking about, um, and then in 2021, we got an NEH grant that was really wonderful and allowed us to hire a project archivist and conduct oral histories. Um, so that's how we try to operate the archives. So um, our archives is the university archives and we have an, a small number of special collections, but the one that's the most important to us is our Colorado Chicano Movement archives. Um, when people think about the Chicano movement in terms of the larger social justice movements of the 60s, people don't realize, first of all, that there was a Chicano movement in addition to the civil rights movement. And when they do think about it, they've mostly heard of Cesar Chavez, or they know about what happened in California or Texas. And people don't realize that Colorado was really a hotbed of the Chicano movement. 
In particular, there was a man named Corky Gonzalez in Denver, Colorado, who formed a crusade for justice, and he wrote a poem, poem called Yo Soy Joaquin. Has anyone heard of? Okay, yay. This, this poem was really pivotal for the students, um, mostly at CU Boulder and around Colorado, and really galvanized the student movement. Um, that's the second collection that we're working with Reveal Digital on, is to provide content for the student activism collection. Um, so going back to the context that I kind of set for you earlier, this was a moment of sort of waking up for these students to realize, wait a minute, this is my homeland. This is, I speak Spanish. I should be proud of my heritage. And they, um, I'm going to switch to the next screen. They were motivated to, to um, rally for various things going on at CU Boulder. For example, one of the things that was really upsetting to them, CU Boulder admitted them because there was pressure to diversify the student body, but then they did things like withhold their financial aid packages because they hadn't filled out some paperwork or you know this excuse or that excuse, which effectively made it impossible for them to stay because they couldn't afford to pay the tuition. So they actually inhabited this building called the TB1 building on um, CU Boulder's campus. What you're seeing here is a picture of the students. Um, they're inhabiting this building. They stayed there for about, I want to say about 17 days. Um, the, the man that you see in the middle there on the left with the beard and the long hair, that's Freddie Freak Trujillo. And the man standing in the doorway is Jose Ortega. These are two of the donors, uh, founding donors to our collection. Um, during this time, six of the student activism members of the group were mysteriously killed in car bombings, which were never solved. The FBI was involved in investigating and could never figure out what they, the FBI said that they must have accidentally set the bombs off. They're now. Um, memorialized at CU Boulder and known as Los Seis de Boulder. Um, so it was a really like emotional time for these students. So following them, uh, following that event, a lot of them, that kind of really dissipated the energy at CU Boulder. That was really demoralizing. A lot of them either graduated or dropped out or left CU Boulder, and many of them came to Pueblo, Colorado. Um, so those are the people that we're working with. Those are our community advisory committee members, people who are actually there, who participated in the events. And in about 2008, um, we got a small grant from the Packard Foundation, which is, a, I think, a local-ish to Colorado uh, charity, to start um, ethnic heritage collections, I think we were calling them. And we were interested in working with all of the different ethnic groups in Pueblo. Pueblo is very diverse. It's the home of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Corporation, which is, was owned by the Rockefellers, which was the largest steel mill west of the Mississippi. And so we have all these different groups in Pueblo. But the one group that really like came forward and wanted to work with us was the Chicano movement community. And I say that intentionally because we do have a diverse community in Pueblo. We have a Latino Chamber of Commerce. We have a Hispanic Education Foundation. So people self-identify in different ways, but I'm specifically talking about those people in our community who consider themselves to be part of the Chicano movement even now. So this isn't a dead collection. This is a living collection with a group of donors who are still living out the Chicano movement, and we still get materials from them about what they're doing now. But um, the bulk of our collection came from Freddie Freak. Uh, he gave us about, uh, I don't even know how many photographs. He was, had been the unofficial archivist of the movement and people were just would throw things away and he'd say, no, let me have that and just store them in his garage. So we got all of these materials from him. Um, the Voices of Protest class that we have that's part of our Chicano Studies program, which just celebrated its 50th anniversary, um, is part of that Chicano Studies minor. And those students would interview some of the community members, and we would get those oral histories and transcripts for the collection. 
Um, as I mentioned, we have a community advisory committee um, who really work with the, with the community. And that's an important point I wanted to bring out. Um, the students, the, the, the folks in our community are very mistrustful of us, of businesses, of government in general. You know, part of our collection documents how the students walked out of classes on our campus at CSU Pueblo to protest um, unfair practices. So it's a big leap of trust for them to hand over these very important materials to the very institution that they were protesting against. So it's taken us 16 years of working with this community to really build that trustful relationship. Um, and so I'm very happy about where we are with that. And I think as I talk in just a second about working with Reveal Digital, that really came into play. Um, so the community advisory committee is key because they are giving us their own materials as well as their friends and their family members. Um, we have about 33 collections in the Colorado Chicano Movement Archives. It includes everything from photographs to uh, bottles of water with sediment from the slag from the steel mill that was in their drinking water, um, buttons, banners, all kinds of things. Um, so it's very unique. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. It's unique and it's important to hear um, the perspective of the people whose materials it is. Yeah, and as I mentioned, it's difficult for us to process it. They have sometimes an unrealistic expectation, so they donate, you know, 100 photographs, and then two weeks later, they're very upset with us because they're not on the website, and they want people to see, and they don't understand, some, in some cases, the process. So why reveal digital? Um, We were just having a meeting with, with JSTOR folks in general. We already subscribe to lots of collections and content. They're a trusted partner already. And I actually didn't know about Reveal Digital and it came up in a meeting that we were having and my ears perked up and I was like, we have so much content that would be so perfect for your collections. And you know, it just was a great win-win conversation that day. And for example, La Cucaracha that Jasmine mentioned, when, when Juan and Debbie Espinoza left CU Boulder and some of their colleagues came to Pueblo, he was a journalism major, um, they just started to start this paper. So this paper was actually published in Pueblo, Colorado, and Reveal Digital already had it in its Independent Voices collection, but it was missing a lot of issues. And what's in, what I think is important is that the issues that it did have, and no offense to the University of Texas, but they're in the Benson Library collection at the University of Texas, along with many, many other Chicano press publications from the time. But what we have is the actual editor of the paper, his own copies of the collection. And not only that, but we have oral history interviews with him and all the other editors, and we have a traveling exhibit that we created with 10 panels um, of, you know, about the creation of the newspaper. So there's all that added content from getting the collection from the source. Um, we, it, it, I'm sure none of you have had this experience. It took just a few back and forth with our legal counsel, <laughs> um, per usual, but we were eventually able to get an MOU signed. And so what's so wonderful for us, um, I'm just gonna jump ahead, is that not only did Reveal Digital provide, you know, shine a light on our collection, but they actually, uh, we sent them what digital files we are, of things we already had digitized, but then things that we haven't had time to digitize, we're able to box up and ship to them. They will do the work. And then we get back the digital files as well as um, the metadata for the item. Um, so I think we are to the point where um, one of our collections is, the, so our La Cucaracha 
additions are already included in the independent voices and I circled there you can see that it does say if you go to the item details it does point people back to our archives so it drives traffic to us um, so it's just a win-win on so many levels for us and that brings me to the end of my comments but I just wanted to say that there are probably many many other collections out there in small libraries, churches, museums, where um, you know, it's not only the content, but it's the context. And it's important to get it from the source, if you will. So um, I think hopefully you've learned something about the revealed digital collections in general, but also the sort of critical importance of participating in a crowdfunding model for unique collections. Thank you. We've got about seven minutes for questions. Yeah, no, I'm very interested in supporting the program. Just went to the website, took a look. It looks like there's many different ways that institutions can contribute at different levels. I thought it might be helpful for myself and everyone else here to just review again what are the different ways in which we can contribute. Right, so I would say the maybe the first Part of, I guess, first contributing opportunity is to contribute to either our diversity and descent fund, which focuses on the four collections that I mentioned, um, American prison newspapers, black periodicals, um, HIV AIDS in the arts, and I think I'm missing one, and student activism, excuse me. Y'all, there's so many collections, it's hard to keep up, um, which is a great thing, but um, so there's, funding that can go directly to supporting those collections as well as behind the scenes, which is in uh, documenting white supremacy, which are like separate from that fund, if that makes sense. So those are separate projects that have separate budgets for funding. Um, and in terms of the annual, and I believe you mentioned some of the other funding tiers, um, I would say that I'm, I'm not quite sure about the differences and how how what that looks like for different libraries, but I'll let Bruce maybe speak to that um, to help provide a little bit more context. Yeah, uh, Bruce Hedrick with uh, uh, JSTOR and Ethica. Uh, so basically what happens is, as you see, we, we with every collection we decide to do, we come up with a budget for it and we raise money for it. So, and then we determine the fees for the for these institution types based on the budget we have to raise. So for behind the scenes, we're trying to raise $2.5 million. So that led to these, these one-time contribution fees being made. Now we put one-time contribution up there because most people were paying us with year-end money, but there are people who do pay annually over a period of three years or five years if they would like to, and, and we do that as well. So every, every collection is really independent and we raise the money for that collection and uh, once the money is raised for that collection, all the content's made open access. And then we spend time, we're a small group of people that, is, that are working on this, so uh, it's, it takes a couple of years to get all the, the you know, if uh, Jasmine's trying to get a million pages published, that might take us two and a half, three years to do that. And just um, on another note to kind of clarify Bruce's point about the funding and how that affects the sourcing and um, availability of the material, all of our collections are open. So there's a certain funding threshold that we seek to reach, and once that threshold is reached, not necessarily the complete funding goal, um, those, those collections are available. So in the case of behind the scenes, although we haven't achieved our goal to reach 2.5 million, that collection is available for people to see what we've published thus far, um, in addition to the other collections that we are currently sourcing material for. Um, and of those seven, Independent voices and student activism are we've we've maxed out our page count goal and the funding that we've acquired for those. So those are considered close, if you will. Um, but American prison newspapers and the remaining five collections that you saw are actively seeking contributions um, and are open to source material as well as open for funding contributions. And technically, I think Independent Voices was already closed when we made our donation, but you made yeah. an exception for us, huh? And sometimes there are cases where um, if we do have leftover funding, let's say for behind the scenes, 
if I am able to source um, 1.1 million pages, but we find that there's a few thousand dollars left over or there's more room in our budget to acquire additional material, then we will make accommodations to max out the funding that we've received for it. Um, so in the case of the La Cucaracha newspaper, we realized that there was still some money left in the pot for Independent Voices material. And when I discovered that we already had some of those issues from other institutions, I figured, why not try to complete a more complete, um, excuse me, try to acquire a more complete collection um, so that researchers can experience it in its totality. Um, and Independent Voices is one where I feel like we still have people that are interested in giving us material for it, even though it's um, over 500,000 pages now uh, of content and started years ago. But it's just sometimes you just find that there's popularity amongst our collections and folks want to source material with us. And if we have the money available, then we will make those exceptions. Maybe we need an independent voices to project some. Yeah. <laughs> yes, alternative press is, is pretty popular um, amongst our different sourcing libraries, so. I think we're at time. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, uh, thanks for uh, attending and thanks for the, for the conversation. Um, and go fund uh, Reveal Digital when you get back to your institutions. Thank you. Thank you.